Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Hello everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you all. I continue to be very much heartened by the emails uh, that have been coming in steady day by day about these recorded sermons for the internet. There is really now no doubt in my mind whatsoever uh, that it was the right thing to do because, simply because of the many people who have written and told me so uh, that a weekly church service is something that was missing in their lives because they haven't been able to find uh, somewhere local, wherever local is to them, that teaches what they believe from the, from the Word of God. So, uh, although m- many of them uh, that have written have been readers of daily Bible study, probably from the very beginning, uh, in 19, uh, 90, 1998, this was not something entirely new, and they feel that it's really a very... It's like a, uh, it, it fills out the picture, so to speak. It does something really that, uh, although the daily studies are useful, and, and certainly a lot of people are making use of them, the weekly church service, I mean, we could just do it ourselves here, and but why uh, do that? Why not record it and make it available to those who want to, to listen? And That was actually the the question that we were going to have. The original idea was that these were not going to be recorded. And again, uh, it wasn't my idea to do it. But I'm glad now that I did. I actually said no at first and because I thought that writing daily Bible study was doing it, was doing all that needed to be done. But again, because there are so many people, and it, it always seems to happen, rarely will you find... Uh, a large group in a, you know within a a, a, a close area uh, where you could form a, a, a group. I, we, we're lucky here, but even here we're scattered. Uh, I've been hearing from many people as this is forming. Uh, finally, uh, we by the way we're we're a little slow on getting this going as well because it's just there's so much work. Uh, my time right now is just completely maxed out between between daily Bible study. And getting this going and forming the church area, uh, and uh, and all of the the things and details that have been had to work out on that, it's a very long work list, and it's taken longer than we had expected, uh, because I have been focusing number one on this because on, on the recorded sermons because they are something that everybody can get, whether you're right here with me, or whether. Uh, you're on the other side of the world. It's something that everybody can have. And everyone is using it. A lot of people are using it. And as I said, it, it's the, it was the right thing to do. I'm certain of that now, even though I, I was reluctant to do it at first. A number of people have also commented on the, the relatively informal nature of these presentations. Most say they very much like it that way. Uh, while others have suggested that I be more formal, although no one uh, has yet been able to clearly tell me what they what they mean by that. As you know, I do regard all of this with the absolute utmost reverence. 
Uh, I am entirely serious uh, about what I'm doing here. Uh, it's just that I have a very deep aversion uh, to anything that, that, that seems pompous. Uh, there may be a number of reasons for that. Uh, the first, perhaps, being that I am, by nature, by personality, informal. Uh, it's just the way I am. Uh, I'm just a poor old country boy, and what you see or hear is the way it truly is. Um, those who know me know that I'm no, no different standing here in this pulpit than I am anywhere else at any other time. Uh, what you see or what you hear is what you've got, and this is it. It's the real thing. Um, but the other reason, uh, in terms of, uh, as a matter of Christianity, the other reason may well be my Catholic upbringing. Uh, quite honestly and quite frankly, uh, from the Catholic Church, I've had my fill of pomposity. Uh, they put on a very big show of righteousness. I mean, I went to a Catholic school. I was, my family are Catholics. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. They are very good at putting on a grand show. But they don't teach the truth. I mean, look at the Pope. Is there anyone more pompous and grand in, in Christian appearance than the Pope? Uh, and yet, the Pope is the very heart and soul of the spirit of Antichrist. So, should we be more like that? No way. No. The other reason, uh, and I just really began to realize this the last couple months uh, from people who write, although I've seen this, actually been watching it for the last 20 years, uh, in that I've witnessed, I was never a member of that church organization, but I regarded it as what it was some years ago as one of the largest organizations of the true people of God in this world. And that organization, as it was, no longer exists today. It doesn't. It exists uh, in name. It exists in uh, as a corporate entity, but it's not the same organization. Uh, and I think what happened there, that apostasy that happened there, happened because the people of that church organization granted their ministers far too much power over them. Uh, when the wolves crept into that organization, as they did, the people should have run them out of there. Uh, but instead, the true people of God were the ones who left. And once that was accomplished, the apostate leadership that crept into that church put that church into a, a full throttle nosedive in terms of the, the truth that it once had. And it, as I said, it still exists today, but it's, it's totally apostate. And I think it happened because the ministers of that church uh, were given too much power by the people of that church. And, and many people of the people who came out of that church organization, many, many of whom I've heard from almost on a daily basis, are of no mind today to allow any minister to have that kind of power over, their, over them again. I know that because many of them have written to me and told me in plain language what their experiences have been. And uh, many of them are now listeners to these sermons, and uh, which is ironic for more ways than you can imagine. But they will, though, tell you now, just as I am, that minister means nothing more than a servant. It's all it means. It doesn't mean lord and master. It doesn't mean some pompous... Uh, master over you. A minister is just your own brother. He's here to, to serve you. Uh, I've watched what happened to that church, as I said, and it's never going to happen here. 
Uh, also, um, to just elaborate on, on something uh, that I said in last week's sermon about that I'm no longer necessary to daily Bible study, some interpreted that to mean uh, that it was a sign that I do intend to stop writing daily Bible study. But that is not correct. Uh, read my lips, as I said last week, and it's, it's on the recording as proof. Uh, I intend to write daily Bible study for the rest of my life. Uh, God willing, for for however long that turns out to be. Uh, I'm 50 now, so uh, hopefully it'll be a few years. Uh, my ancestors tended to be very long-lived people, so however long it is, uh, we'll see. But as I said, I, I don't intend to ever stop. Uh, but what I meant about not being necessary Two, two daily Bible studies that is was based simply on questions that come in on a daily basis. Rarely now, rarely ask something that that hasn't been addressed in at least one uh, readily available online Bible study. Uh, in fact, that's how I most often answer questions uh, now, almost all the time, simply by referring people. Uh, to an existing online study. Um, not just because it saves time by not just having to, to retype over and over something that's already right there, but because the online study has all of the, the further reading links and, and is, is illustrated and all of that. The online study uh, simply answers, is capable of answering a question much better and more completely than an email can. It's just a matter of providing the most information. And the online studies are designed, uh, if you want to be there for five minutes, I mean, you can read a study in five or ten minutes, or you can be there for days, as some people have, uh, just following links. You can be there as long as you want, or as little as you want. It's there for however uh, it was designed that way, and many people seem to like the way that's, that's been done. So, But that's what I meant by my, my not being necessary to daily Bible study. Now, if I weren't here, uh, much of what's what I would, the way I answer questions now is simply referring to what's already there. So I'm not really necessary to it. But as as far as the actual existence of daily Bible study goes, I am necessary to it. Uh, I have soul control. People have asked about that. Uh, I do have soul control and ownership of Keyway Publishing. Um, so although Keyway Publishing owns the copyrights. To everything that's there, uh, plus the internet domain registrations for daily Bible study, I own Keyway Publishing, so it's which is just a small company. It's just a matter of it's something that's necessary in the modern world uh, in order to be able to do the business of, of the things that we need to do to pay the bills and, and all of that, and the, the servers and the, the people that we have to deal with to make this ministry possible. But I'm not going anywhere. As I said, people did ask that, and uh, it, it was not a lead-up to, uh, to ending daily Bible study. I, I, as I said, I'm going to be here doing this for as long as I live, God willing, however long that is, and hopefully now these sermons as well. So we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. Well, good old Pat Robertson has got himself into big trouble again, hasn't he? Uh, I personally never seen his program, but I am I am familiar with him, uh, mostly because of the outrageous remarks that he seems prone to. Uh, the last big one uh, was when he suggested that uh, the U.S. State Department in Washington should be destroyed by a nuclear bomb, uh, <laughs> which is something that I would have thought only criminally, criminally minded people like Osama bin Laden would would want to see happen. Uh, not not an American talking about doing such a thing to his own nation, but uh, now, uh, this time, Mr. Robertson uh, has said that he thinks that uh, the president of Venezuela should be assassinated. Uh, the U.S. and Venezuela are not in a state of war, so uh, murdering their president would, uh, would be an outright act of murder. Uh, there's no legal justification whatsoever to kill the man uh, in the eyes of man or of God. Uh, but assassinating their president would certainly start a war. Uh, there isn't one now, but uh, killing their president would certainly do it. And such a war 
would also cut off, what is it, one-fifth of the U.S. oil supply that it gets from Venezuela, uh, just practically overnight, sending off a, a flash depression. Um, it, it's just crazy. Um, Robertson uh, apparently uh, later denied saying it, uh, saying instead that he meant kidnapping, as though there wouldn't be anything criminal about just kidnapping another country's president. But uh, after the video right from his own show plainly showed him, showed him alluding to assassination, he, he cut out the lying and, and just owned up to it and apologized. But the damage is done, isn't it? I mean, Mr. Robertson is entitled to to what he to say what he thinks and, and all of that, but um, people who actually teach the Word of God, who actually teach the Word of God, can see years of hard work destroyed just in a few minutes uh, by comments such as those made by, by well-known people like Mr. Robertson, who claims to be a Christian. How many people... In, in numerous nations around the world heard those comments and said to themselves if that's Christianity I don't want anything to do with it how many were just close to conversion and then heard Mr. Robertson's remarks and just were driven away by them I wonder uh, hopefully most hopefully and we certainly pray that uh, most people can recognize the difference uh, between true true men of God uh, and simply ignore uh, the ramblings of, of a very arrogant and unchristian man. But a lot of people in many countries around the world are going to turn away from Christian, Christianity when they heard things like that. that that's already proven. Uh, here's a news article from the Associated Press. Helsinki, Finland. The only Christian TV channel in Finland said Thursday it will stop airing shows by American televangelist Pat Robertson because of his call to assassinate Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. The channel said its purpose was to spread a Christian message, not indulge in politics. It's, a sad, it's sad that a leading Christian figure makes these kinds of statements, said the channel's executive. Uh, on Monday, Robertson called for the assassination of Chavez, saying you, the U.S. government should take him out. Robertson apologized Wednesday after saying his comments had been misinterpreted. All of that makes uh, a lot of people think of Christ's warning to people who, who do or say things that make little babes in Christ turn away from Christ. Uh, in Christ's own words, but whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. The English word rapture is derived from the Latin word rapier, meaning to rape and plunder, or to seize and carry away. That's rather shocking, isn't it, considering what rapture has come to mean in the minds of so many people today. But look it up in any good dictionary, and there you will find it. Over time, however, rapture came to mean a state of being carried away by overwhelming emotion. It went from a physical to a psychological meaning. Then, about 200 years ago, only about 200 years ago, rapture began to be used as a name for a religious doctrine, which has become quite famous today, as you know. Millions of a Bible reading people believe in a rapture even though rapture is not found anywhere in the Bible 
not in the original languages, nor in any correctly translated translation of the Bible. So how did the rapture idea get to be so big? I've always found it difficult to answer questions that people send about the so-called rapture for a number of reasons, uh, including those just stated. Uh, Another, though, is that before I can answer someone's question about the rapture, I almost always have to write back and ask which rapture that they believe in. Because there are actually many rapture doctrines, widely differing rapture doctrines, that people have come up with in the last two or three hundred years. Uh, As we said, the rapture theory was practically unknown before the 1800s. Some believe that God's people will be so-called raptured away before the Great Tribulation, while others believe that the rapture will happen in the middle of the Great Tribulation, while others believe that it will happen at the end of the Great Tribulation. So, there's a number of years difference right there. On top of that, some people believe that they will be raptured to safety in heaven, while others believe that they will be raptured to a place of safety here on earth. And to add more to the confusion, some have declared that the rapture will occur as a result of two returns of Jesus Christ. And even they are divided. Uh, Some believe that Christ's first return will, in effect, be a bounce or a secret coming, uh, while others believe that Christ will return and hide out on earth with his raptured people until his, his and their public return later. So, do you see why it's so hard to answer questions about the rapture? It's impossible to do it without first finding out almost what a personal belief about the rapture is. You almost have to do it individually, one by one, because there is no specific rapture theory that people who believe in the rapture agree on. Uh, It's really a doctrine of confusion. Individual people are maybe sure of it in their own minds on, on whichever version of it, But when you take the rapture and look at it as a doctrine overall, it's full of conflicts and confusion. But as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14.33, God is not the author of confusion. God's word is not confusion. It's as plain as day. The Holy Bible does not speak of any rapture at or around the time of Christ's return. Instead, it plainly speaks of and describes a resurrection at the time of the one and only return of Jesus Christ. That will happen, as the Word of God says, at the last trump or the last trumpet and they will all that same day be on earth not to hide but to rule with a rod of iron with and under Jesus Christ that is overwhelmingly proven in the word of God For example, here, as stated by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17, we see how the dead of God's people will be resurrected to life on the day of his return, while those who are alive that day will be transformed to spirit to be like those who are resurrected that day. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
Even so them also which sleep in Christ will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That alone explains the first resurrection. That alone precludes a rapture, according to the most most of the rapture theories, according to the definition of rapture that people have. They have to ignore those verses in order for the rapture idea to work. And further, again here from Matthew 24, 29 to 31, we read of how the elect will be gathered right at the time of Christ's return, not years or months before or after his return, as one or another of the rapture theories propose. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's not describing a rapture, is it? It's describing a gathering of God's people on the day of his return. It's then that they will meet him, as the verses that we quoted before describe. There's no rapture there. And again, from Revelation 20, 5-6, we read of how those same people from the first resurrection, or who are changed that day, if they're alive that day, of the, of the day of Christ's return, will then rule the earth with him during the next 1,000 years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Isn't that plain? The, the pure and simple word of God, to simply read what's there and accept it as truth. There it is. That's not the word of any man. That's not a doctrine that was invented sometime two or three hundred years ago and which now millions of people have accepted as truth. That is the pure and simple word of God right there in your own Bible. It's there for you to believe because God, God's word, is true. And it's existed for a whole lot longer than just two or three hundred years, hasn't it? Now, who are the so-called elect that are mentioned in those verses that we've just read? Those who will be gathered from the four winds on the day of Christ's return. Well, elect is an English word that has been used to translate the original Hebrew words of the Bible which describe those who have been or will be elected or chosen by God for a purpose to become the first fruits of salvation. They are the people who Satan hates more than anything in the world. Those elect, those people will be resurrected or transformed if alive that day into immortal spirit beings on the day of Christ's return, as we've just read. They will then reign with him for the 1,000 years, so-called millennium, after which the resurrection of the rest of humanity will occur. 
Now, does that mean that the elect are somehow better than the rest of humanity who will be gathered or resurrected later? No. They are simply chosen to serve a purpose, to do a, to do a job. That's all. Humans may think highly of themselves, but the truth is, humans are a dime a dozen in God's sight. The only thing that makes anyone worth anything to God is their personal choice to obey God. That's why the elect are also referred to in the Bible as saints. Saints, or saint, is from an original word which simply means set apart or sanctified, something that is the manifestation of their obedience to God. That's what sets them apart from a world that really doesn't know God yet. That's what makes them God's people in what is still Satan's world. It won't be until after Christ's return that Satan will be put away and it won't be Satan's world anymore. God's people today are foreigners here. No matter where we are, we're foreigners. Because we are citizens, if you are of God's people, you are citizens of the coming kingdom of God. This world is still Satan's kingdom. I mean, look around. Look at the evil. Look at the nonsense. Look at the confusion, the Babylon that this world is. But if you think that somehow being saints or the elect makes them so blessed that nothing bad will ever happen to them, or that they will therefore escape the tribulation, as the rapture ideas say, think again. Because the Holy Bible plainly says that before the day of Christ's return comes, the end time elect are going to face and and experience horrible, horrendous persecution at the hands of the Church of Rome and of all of the Protestant churches who are going to return to the papacy after the Pope's false miracles start. It isn't going to be Muslim terrorists who are going to be the great enemies of true Christians. It's going to be people who who believe that they are Christians, but who are not. As described here in Revelation 17, 3-6, we read of the great harlot, who is called a great religious harlot because of of her religious adultery that she has committed over the centuries becoming involved in politics and being more politics than Christianity from Revelation 17 3 to 6 so he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns that's describing the Roman Empire and the Church of Rome And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus." That's not describing God's people as being raptured to a place of safety, is it? When it's speaking of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus that's going to be happening in the days and the years before Christ's return. There's no rapture to a place of safety there. Nor is there in this, in Christ's own words from Matthew 24, 21-22, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's not talking about taking them away to a place of safety or rapturing them in one of the ways that the rapture theories are speaking of. 
it's going to be stopped by Christ's return, and that's the only thing that's going to stop it. The elect will emerge victorious with Christ, but until that day happens, God's people are going to face tribulation, not a rapture. That's what the Bible says. What does tribulation mean then? Well, the English word tribulation is derived from the ancient Latin word tribulum, which was a device used for threshing grain. Threshing was, by its nature, a violent process, uh, as it still is, as as a number of farmers uh, who have been injured or killed by combines or threshing machines over the years. It was a machine in which, or a process in which, grain was furiously beaten and thrashed to separate it from the straw and the chaff. From that, tribulation came to mean a severe trial or catastrophic event. Much of the Bible uh, uses agricultural terminology because the nature or the, the culture of that time was agricultural. Uh, the uh, annual holy days are primarily agricultural based in their symbolism. They use agriculture as their symbolism symbolism in terms of salvation, uh, the harvest of humanity. Uh, it's used to translate the original Greek word of the New Testament pronounced slipsis which means anguish or persecution. That's what tribulation means. And Christians have always been subject to it, as stated by Paul in Acts 14.22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. There can be, however, by its definition, only be one great tribulation. As it says, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. That's talking one great tribulation. That will occur in the time just before Christ's return. It's not talking about the tribulation of evil people or of, of unreligious people. It's talking about the tribulation of God's people who are not going to be raptured anywhere. We know from the Word of God that great tribulation is coming upon God's people. We know that. Christ's all of that prophecy is one of the most plain and specific and ominous prophecies that he gave to his people in describing the time that people will face, his people will face, not in the time of the apostles to whom the prophecy was given, although they certainly knew tribulation and martyrdom and persecution. They all, with one exception, were martyred. The only one that made it to old age was John. And even then, we don't know what eventually might have happened to him. Although he was an old man by the time it did happen. He was into his 90s when he wrote the book of Revelation. But consider what Jesus Christ said in his Olivet Prophecy is going to happen. And see if you can see a rapture to a place of safety here. In Christ's own words, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars, and see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of the sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that ye ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath day for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no no ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh saved <clears throat> but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened then if any man shall say unto you lo here is Christ or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shine, shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. For when, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his, together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Did you read of any rapture? to a place of safety there anywhere? It's not there, is it? Christ also plainly said there that his return will be once, a one-time event. It won't be a bounce. It won't be secret. He is coming once. We should just stop and interject here another historical, very important historical and prophetic reality about the biblical term gathering. As we've seen, there will be a gathering of the elect of God, the saints of God, at Christ's return, by resurrection if they are dead, or by a change to spirit if they are alive on the day of Christ's return. But there is another major gathering, another exodus that is coming around Christ's return, and that will be a physical gathering of Israel and Judah who have been scattered over the earth how did that happen how did they get scattered around the earth one of the most misunderstood subjects of Bible study involves the total political division of Israel and Judah that occurred at the time of King Rehoboam the son of King Solomon before then all twelve tribes of Israelites were a united kingdom through the reigns of David and Solomon. But after Solomon's death, they split into two completely separate and independent kingdoms, 
there was a southern kingdom of Judah, consisting of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with part of Levi, since the Levites were distributed among the other tribes, and they had their capital at Jerusalem. And then there was the northern northern kingdom of Israel, consisting of the other ten tribes, Reuben, Simeon, uh, Dan, Naphtali, uh, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Ephraim, and Manasseh. I think I did that right. Uh, Joseph uh, was divided into Ephraim and Manasseh. I think I said those right, did I? Okay. You'll let me, I'm, I'm sure someone will let me know if I didn't. With part of Levi, again, since the Levites were distributed among the other tribes, uh, with their ca- and their capital was up in Samaria. Israel and Judah were never united again. Surprisingly, they even fought wars against each other. There was a time when the Jews were at war with Israel, as shocking as that may seem, but it's, an, it's a matter of biblical history. A very, very important fact that many do not realize today. Many very important and high-ranking uh, Christian leaders of this world do not realize today is that Judah, that is the Jewish people of today, are only one of the tribes of Israel. While all Jews are Israelites, not all Israelites are Jews. Only the Jews were Jews. The people of Judah were Jews. The others, the others of the tribes, of the other Israelite tribes, were not Jews. They were Benjamites or Gadites or Levites or Ephraimites and so on. Because of their forsaking of him, God permitted the two kingdoms to be destroyed. First, the northern kingdom of Israel was gradually conquered by the Assyrians. And by about 721 B.C., they had practically all been taken into exile to Assyria. The vast majority, majority of them never returned. Not to this day have they returned, and are still known over the centuries and today as the so-called Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. Then, about 135 years later, by 586 B.C., the southern kingdom of Judah was completely conquered by the Babylonians, who were then taking their turn as the superpower of the world. And the people of Judah were taken into captivity to Babylon, which is today Iraq. The original temple of God in Jerusalem uh, was destroyed at that time, and the Ark of the Covenant went missing around about that time. The people of the southern kingdom of Judah, however, did return after the Babylonians fell to the Persians, when the Persians were taking their turn as the superpower of the world. And upon that return of Judah at that time, those descendants became the Jewish people of today. But that return in the time of Nehemiah, or the founding of of the modern state of Israel centuries later in 1948 were not the fulfillment of the many prophecies spoken of in the Bible that deal with the future. As these these verses we're about to read plainly show, the future gathering of all of Israel, meaning Israel and Judah. There are many scriptures which describe in great detail and as plain as day the future gathering of Israel and Judah. Example, from um, Jeremiah 54 to 7. In those days and in at that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. They sure aren't doing that now, are they? Just to interject that point. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. My people hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. And oh, how true that is. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. That means the people of Israel don't know who they are today. And that's true. All that have, all that found them have devoured them, and their adversaries said, We offend not, because they 
have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. And also from Jeremiah 31, 8 to 10. Note again, clearly, that this has not happened yet. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth, travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. Another exodus. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. Will I lead them? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. This is speaking of the lost ten tribes of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. That's speaking of the lost ten tribes of Israel today. And once again, from another prophet, speaking of the coming Messiah's rule, from Ezekiel 37, uh, 19-23, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows. Again, this is the lost ten tribes. And I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, which is the Jewish people, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. No more presidents, no more prime ministers. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And once again, you'll notice with them also, there is no rapture. They are where they are, and they will be there, until Christ returns to bring them home. And it will be those of the first resurrection that we've already discussed who will be the teachers and leaders of that physical gathering of Israel and Judah. Two gatherings all around the same time. But there is no rapture in there anywhere. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. <laughs>